Robinson Center, I'm Hale Svandiari. Um, sorry for uh, starting the meeting a few minutes late. Uh, one of our panelists just arrived, and the other one, I believe, is at the at Union Station, Dan Kurtzer, and will join us uh, very soon. Mm, we have had 82 RSVPs, so therefore, uh, we decided to hold the meeting in this in the auditorium. So I'm sure that there will be more people joining us. Um, today's meeting, the other Arab-Israeli conflict, the Middle East in the classroom, is actually a book launch for this fantastic book for which is Arabs and Israelis conflict and peacemaking <coughs> in the Middle East. Um, you can purchase the book outside during the break or after uh, the, pan the second panel. Um, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars was established in 19. 68. We are a nonpartisan center which aims to unite the world of ideas with the world of policy by uh, supporting preeminent uh, scholarship and linking that scholarship to issues of concern to officials in Washington. Congress established the center as the official national memorial to President Wilson. Uh, for our meetings, we invite a diverse group of speakers and present a variety of views. The views expressed at our meetings are not the Wilson Center views. Uh, before I introduce uh, our moderators, uh, let me say a few words about the Middle East program. The program began in 1998. And in addition to spotlighting day-to-day -day issues, uh, it continues to concentrate on long-term regional developments and their impact on political and social structure, economic development, and relations with the United States. Uh, these days, it's very difficult to keep up with the development in <clears throat> in the region, look at Iran, look at the countries of the Arab Spring, look at Syria, and uh, look at the future relationship between the Persian Gulf states and uh, Iran, and many more such issues. Uh, today, we are having two panels. The first panel is moderated by uh, my colleague and good friend Aaron David Miller, who is the Vice President for New Initiatives and the Distinguished Scholar at the Wilson Center. For uh, two decades, he served as an advisor to Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State, helping formulate U.S. policy on the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli peace process. He also served as the Deputy Special Middle East Coordinator for Arab-Israeli negotiations. <clears throat> he was a senior member of the State Department's policy planning staff in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research and in the Office of the Historian. Aaron has written four books on the Middle East. His last book on the Middle East was The Much to Promised Land, America's Elusive Search for Arab-Israeli Peace, and he's the author of the forthcoming, very provocative book called The Impossible Presidency, Why America Can't Have Another Great President. Our second panel is moderated by Robin Wright. And if our president, Jane Harmon, was here, she would refer to Robin and Aaron as our rock stars. So I thought I have to repeat what she always says. Robin is a journalist, author, and foreign policy analyst. She is currently a joint USIP senior fellow, uh, Wilson Center Distinguished Scholar, 
her book, Rock the Casbah, Rage and Rebellion Across the Islamic World, won the 2012 Overseas Press Club Award for Best Book on International Affairs. Her other books, I'm talking about her recent books, include the Iran Primer, Power Politics and U.S. Policy, and also the Islamists are coming, who they really are. Robin's project on this, the, on the last book, The Islamists Are Coming, uh, explored new trends in the Islamic world, the Arab revolt, the rise and fall of political Islam, and future of the Middle East, and the new U.S.-Iran uh, diplomacy. If I'm not mistaken, the primer is the, mo the site of the primer is the most visited site uh, uh, from around the globe when it comes to Iranian uh, issues, and it's uh, and they feed the site all the time. Um, Robin uh, has reported for more than 140 countries on six continents for the Washington Post, LA Times, Sunday Times, CBS News, the Christian Science Monitor, and other. On a personal note, I must say that I am indebted to Robin for all she did, um, and she did a lot, really a lot, when I was detained in Iran in uh, prison so that I can't help but always mention that personal note. We have circulated a longer version of the bios, and the moderator will introduce uh, the panelists. Um, but before we move to the first panel, I would like to invite uh, Shai Feldman, one of the authors of this fantastic book, uh, uh, to come and say a few words. Shai is the director of the Crown Center and professor of politics at Brandeis University. He will explain the book and then he will come back as a panelist uh, on the second panel to reply to the comments made about the book during uh, the first panel. Shai, please. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Hale, for for everything and for uh, putting this together. Um, I'll be very brief uh, as a background uh, to uh, to this to the two panels, just to uh, give you some uh, background as to how the, all this uh, all this came about. I was asked uh, in two thousand and four, and we something that uh, eventually came to fruition in January 2005 uh, to come to uh, Brandeis University after I've served uh, for 28 years in different roles uh, at the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies in Tel Aviv uh, to establish a center for, uh, for Middle East Studies uh, at Brandeis. And um, uh, my view of this was that the center, uh, to be credible, um, has to almost mark on every wall around it uh, the words balanced and dispassionate. And that the key to uh, being balanced and dispassionate is that the center uh, would reflect the region uh, and the diversity uh, of the region. And to do that, um, I uh, requested two of my close colleagues who, with whom I've had uh, different working relationships uh, spanning from two to three decades, uh, whether they would join me uh, and uh, for the three of us to become the nucleus uh, of the Crown Center, uh, Dr. Khalil Shikaki from Ramallah and Dr. Abu Said Ali, who was uh, then the director of the Al Aram Center uh, in Egypt. And, uh, and happily they agreed uh, to come and join me. Uh, at least on a, I would call it, on a permanent part-time basis, uh, since both of them were leading uh, the centers uh, and were not about to abandon uh, the centers they were leading. And so we entered uh, a conversation about what content 
uh, do we insert into this uh, relationship, into us, three of us, becoming the nucleus of the Crown Center. And we tried, and we decided uh, that we would teach a class uh, at Brandeis that uh, we didn't think uh, had an equivalent in other universities uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict, but a class in which uh, all three of us are team teach. Two of us are in class, uh, every class, which allows uh, the opportunity to sensitize students uh, not only to the texts of uh, the competing narratives about the conflict, but also this, the texture of the texture of these competing uh, narratives. And uh, because we uh, got very uh, positive re uh, responses from our students, and we were also urged by one of our uh, donors who attended uh, one of our classes and said this can't stay uh, in the confines of this classroom that has only 25 to 30 students. You have to make this uh, uh, available to a much larger constituency. Uh, began this journey uh, of transforming and translating the experience we gained in the classroom in, in, in this new approach to the region uh, to, to, the, to this textbook which, again, I believe is the first textbook on the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict that's co-authored by an Israeli, a Palestinian, uh, and an Egyptian. And, uh, and, and essentially, uh, what we try to do is, again, follow with the textbook the logic uh, of our class. And so this book has uh, 13 chapters. It's a, it's a university textbook. It's built for a 13-week semester. And the most important thing is that all the chapters have the same structure. Uh, which is uh, the first third of all the chapters are what we refer to as uh, main developments, but it is basically the uncontested dimensions of the history of the conflict, which is those issues regarding which Arabs and Israelis don't disagree about. So everything that the three of us agreed on, by definition, uh, comprises the uncontested, uh, the uncontested uh, parts of uh, of the history. And the second uh, third of uh, all the chapters uh, provides uh, the students uh, a sense of uh, first what was the Palestinian narrative, what was the Israeli narrative, and what were Arab narratives uh, about the most important developments uh, in the history of the conflict. A and finally, the, the last third of every chapter is an effort uh, to, to provide students, um, in addition to sensitizing them, to the competing narratives, which I mentioned earlier, is an effort to, uh, to sensitize, uh, to provide students with an analytical tool uh, with which to analyze uh, important developments in the history of the conflict. So that, uh, this, so that it, once they've finished our class, or in this case, finished reading the textbook, they have a toolbox uh, with which to analyze developments if they take place six months from now or two years from now. And I'll just end by giving you just three sentences of worth of what is this analytical tool. It basically tells students something very simple. If you want to understand any important development in the history of the conflict, you have to answer to yourselves four questions. One, uh, what in the international system happened that might explain that development in the history of the relations between Israelis and Arabs? Secondly, what happened in the region that might explain this development in Arab-Israeli relations. The third is what happened in the domestic politics of the main protagonists that, again, impacted and can explain uh, what happened in, uh, in, the, in, in the relations between Israel uh, and, and, and the Arab states or Israel and the Palestinians. And the final question is, uh, what was the role of leaders? Uh, what, what impact did, did individual leaders have and in, in a way, what we're asking everybody to ask themselves is if that particular individual was replaced by another, a different personality, a different leader, um, how would that have impacted uh, the conflict or how would that have impacted the particular development that we're trying to explain? Um, so that's basically the, the, the idea. Uh, as I said, the logic also of these chapters follow the logic that we developed in, in teaching this class. Uh, and I think I'll stop here so that we'll leave enough for, uh, for the second session. Thank you. And, 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 and just one last word, which is, uh, again, just thank you to, to Halle for, for uh, this cooperation and for putting everything together. And, um, and thank you all for coming.
Shai, thanks a lot. Um, in thinking through the significance of today's panel, we stole the title of the panel from Steven Spiegel's book, The Other Arab Israeli Conflict. But in thinking about that, it occurred to me that in addition to the Arab Israeli conflict that has played out in the region, there are at least three or four other Arab Israeli conflicts. Call them the derivative conflicts. There's the conflict in Washington, the battle for the mind of Washington, which is the subject of Steven Spiegel's book. Um, there's the conflict in the media uh, in which these issues are debated. There's the conflict uh, between the various communities, certainly in the United States, the Arab, Jewish, Muslim communities, as they struggle for, uh, to represent their own views and, and to seek influence uh, with policymakers. And then there's the struggle, I guess you could call it a struggle, uh, in the classroom. Uh, the struggle for teaching a reasonably balanced and authoritative and legitimate uh, history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, I I've had a lot of experience, minimal experience in the classroom, a lot of experience in understanding the relationship between these three, among these three narratives and negotiations. Uh, uh, the problem between Arabs and Israelis is often described as driven by the fact that they really don't understand one another. But I wonder, actually, if it's not the opposite, that they really understand one another only too well. And the reality is those understandings or lack of understandings are driven by these narratives. And I think it's, it's why I'm really impressed by this volume. It's really not a book as much as it is a living instrument for instruction. And it, it's really, I don't, I'm not sure anything like it has been attempted uh, before, uh, which is why today's discussion, I, I think, is extremely important. We're, we're fortunate to have with us um, three analysts, um, two of whom have had experience in negotiations, but they're all teachers, I think, in the best, best sense of the word. They're all teachers. Um, and I hope that they will focus in their comments um, on the uh, advantages and, if there are, disadvantages of the so-called triple narrative from their own personal experiences in the classroom. Because that, I think, is really what is at, at, at issue here. They'll each speak for 10 minutes, and then we will go to your, uh, your questions and answers. So. Um, why don't we begin, Chibli, with you? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, it, it's really a pleasure for me to be here, uh, but especially to comment on this book and uh, uh, start off by saying something about the three scholars who co-authored uh, this book, and I think they're known to, to most of you, uh, but I think you could not have had uh, better three people to represent the different narratives. I, I think each one... Um, has uh, not only a full understanding of the angle that they're addressing, but really even individually, I think you could have written a book on their own on this same subject and really have been judicious, uh, even without the presence of the other views. So we have credible scholars um, who have been at it, uh, both in, in practice and also um, in the scholarship, and uh, very well informed, and therefore they speak with some authority when they're representing these narratives. That's extraordinarily important because obviously, you know, we could all attempt at the narrative, but, but the voices matter in terms of who's interpreting the narrative. So starting with that, it lends this volume even more credibility. Now, you know, for me, as both a student of this conflict and also a teacher of this conflict in, in the classroom, um, so what am I looking for usually uh, when I'm introducing it? Of course, we all have our own views, and there is so much scholarship on this issue. There, there's uh, unending interpretation. Uh, uh, just last week, we've had the release of the CIA documents on the Camp David Accords uh, back in 1978. Uh, some very interesting new stuff that actually is going to have a there it's going to send us back to revisit some of the issues surprisingly with all these years and all the information that we have known there's still some new information so yes there's always room for scholarship information and uh, and this book is not that uh, obviously that's not what it attempts to do but there is more i think hunger for presenting a uh, a credible view that is well informed that is backed by um, uh, knowledge 
um, that uh, present the different narratives. I mean, they use the term narratives, and I think that that's correct. And and for me, when I, uh, for example, uh, as a student of negotiations, when I look back at um, any round of Israeli-Arab negotiations, let's take the the uh, Camp David 2000 between Israelis and Palestinians that uh, um, uh, uh, Dan and I and, and others have, have, have written a volume on uh, more recently. Uh, when you look at, when you actually v revisit those negotiations, um, it, it's inevitable that you're going to discover um, that part of the problem is a narrative problem. Uh, it, it isn't just an issues problem. Because for start with, you know, the the Israeli language, which is we offered them 90 percent of the territory, meaning we, we are making a concession by offering 90 percent of the territory because the Israeli assumption is they control that territory and they're offering that 90 percent to the Palestinians. Well, the Palestinians have start from the point of view this is their territory, so you're asking them to give up 10 percent of what they control, separate from the Palestinian narrative about the West Bank and Gaza constituting 22 percent of, of, of Palestine. So that language particularly is profoundly important. And, and I think it's also important for the mediator in terms of which language they adopt in, 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 uh, uh, in those negotiations. So one of the things that I found really particularly useful about this book is that it did start with some base uh, of information but then it really went through these three big narratives, uh, principally the Israeli narrative, the Palestinian narrative, and the broader Arab narrative about each conflict. I think from the point of view of students, uh, this is uh, especially welcome because uh, I think we are uh, in a, in a um, uh, kind of a, a, the, in the middle of a discourse about uh, the, the conflict that's inevitably pol uh, partly political uh, as, as Aaron said about the other uh, Arab-Israeli conflict, to use uh, St uh, Steve Spiegel's, uh, the title of his book, it, it, it's inevitable that the narratives themselves are politicized because people are trying to fight for support in Washington for their side. And so there is a battle related to that. And I think not the story doesn't it, it, it's not fully told in the same way that is told here with authority and credibility. The second thing that I found particularly useful um, was I think the, uh, you know, what, what, what they call the level of analysis issue, focus on, on the system, uh, the international system broadly, the <clears throat> U.S. obviously part of that international system. So the American role in some ways is discussed through this international system uh, and the regional system as well. So they, they look at both you know, in, in most of the chapters is a regional assessment as well as a, a global assessment of distribution of power and its consequences uh, for the particular episode they're looking at, but they also look at the state level, the internal dynamics, the political dynamics of each state and how they were influencing the decisions, and then the individual level where, you know, the leadership issue and how it impacted uh, some of those considerations. So in that sense, I think what you get is really a uh, uh, powerful flavor of the context in which these negotiations took place in a way that doesn't answer questions, but really starts a conversation that I think is more meaningful. Uh, they, um, you know, when, when I look at some of the, um, the cases, there, there are conclusions um, uh, on issues like uh, the three of them come to agreement on by no def by by they're not comprehensive by any means or decisive because I think the the issues are are far broader uh, but it is a f fabulous and powerful instrument I think for teaching the Arab Israeli conflict now I just want to say a couple of words about then so what you don't get from this um, obviously uh, I mean you have to look at the scale of this is 470 some pages uh, covering uh, really uh, pretty much a century of Arab-Israeli conflict because it's from the inception uh, all the way through uh, present time. So it's sweeping in its attempt. And obviously, in all these issues, you're looking at um, multiple narratives, some basic information that is agreed upon, and then analysis at different level, and some issues in which they agree on every major episode during that period. So obviously, that is very ambitious, a lot to cover. Therefore you are not going to get 
the full flavor of uh, each one of those cases. Uh, and, and some of them, you're going to get really very brief analysis, um, uh, and particularly when it comes uh, to the outside role. If, if you're looking for the American role, it's there, but certainly that's not part of the key narrative because you, you're, you're looking at the regional, the Israeli, the Palestinian, and the Arab narrative. And sometimes when it's discussed, it's a, you know, it tends to be very, very brief in a way that may not capture some of the central issues. For example, um, uh, again, going back to Camp David 2000 um, uh, and uh, looking at the American role, uh, the authors speak, I think, powerfully of the American moment. Um, the American moment, obviously, the post uh, Cold War unipolar, unipolar moment of the U.S. and the, the empowerment of the U.S. And therefore, uh, some of that uh, American moment uh, explains a lot of what the U.S. did or could have done or the opportunity that the U.S. had, and they, they capture that well. In the analysis, for example, of inevitably had to be brief. So uh, in essence, when you're looking at the assessment of the American role, you, you get basically a half a page in the context of the systemic uh, systemic level uh, on on Camp David, and and that American moment uh, correctly is identified as have giving the U.S. an unusual opportunity that was missed. No one would deny that, but that American moment also had meant by definition uh, that the the Arab-Israeli conflict became less important for the U.S. strategically by virtue of the absence of the Soviet Union. So in, in a way. Uh, yes, it, it gave the U.S. more of an opportunity, but there was also less of an incentive, uh, which explains part of the failure of American diplomacy, as we discovered when we were going through uh, the files. So uh, clearly, you know, the, the, since the volume isn't really a full assessment of those issues, it is intended, obviously, to, to, um, uh, to be comprehensive rather than deep by default. And in that, it succeeds, I think, brilliantly in... Uh, presenting something that our students, uh, I think, need. Jubilee, thank you. Asher. Um, thank you for inviting me, Hala. This I was a fellow here in 2009 and 10, so it's great to be back here. I spent a great uh, academic year, year here. Uh, I teach at the University of Notre Dame, which is not known for its uh, strength in Middle East uh, studies has other strengths. And uh, before coming here, I looked at uh, the website of the university, the library website, and I checked uh, the composition of Arab Israel in our website, and I had no library, and I saw 1660, 1,663 titles uh, that the combination of Arab Israel uh, show up uh, there. If you go to other libraries with a stronger Middle Eastern uh, focus, I'm sure you will find thousands and thousands of uh, uh, items that the title include uh, these two uh, these two terms uh, i think the same applies for uh, actual textbooks on this uh, conflict i mean i it took me about uh, one minute to come up with uh, 10 to 15 that i'm uh, familiar with so here is another textbook on the arab israeli uh, conflict one might ask why do we need yet another textbook on the arab israeli uh, conflict and from my perspective as a teacher of this uh, conflict, uh, a new textbook merit is, there is a reason for the textbook for two reasons, or there are two reasons uh, we could be, uh, that could be taken into account. One is uh, the book has to, be, has, has to say something uh, new that has not been said uh, before, and the other is that it has to say it in a way that has not been said uh, before. The, uh, the content itself and the way the, the information is laid out and uh, this book, in my opinion, actually captures uh, these two uh, qualities together through the very unique structure, the unique uh, composition of the three authors. Not only do they manage to um, give us a fresh look of uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, but they also uh, present uh, uh, new content that could only be analyzed and could only be uh, displayed through the, this composition of three uh, uh, authors. Uh, as you, as uh, Aaron has already said, uh, this conflict is fought not only in the battleground or here in Washington, but also in uh, uh, classrooms. Uh, classrooms uh, 
primary, secondary uh, classrooms in Israel, Palestine, uh, but also here in uh, university colleges, uh, there is the battle is uh, raging. And in fact, textbooks are labeled uh, as being pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian. Tell me what textbook you are using, and I'll tell you what your political convictions uh, are. And I can tell you, you know, a small uh, incident or a small story of my own experience. Uh, I was I received a phone call from uh, a certain lobbyist from a certain lobby here in Washington, asking me to uh, invite to my class a certain speaker to my uh, uh, Israel-Palestine uh, uh, class. And uh, while we were having this conversation, he asked me nonchalantly what textbook I was using. Uh, and he was trying basically to scope me to figure out what kind of, what, what, is my, what are my politics. So I think those of us who teach this uh, conflict uh, know what I'm talking about. Textbooks are labeled. Uh, and the merit of this textbook is that it cannot be labeled. Uh, if I gave uh, an answer to that uh, particular certain lobbyist, you know, I'm teaching this uh, book, I don't think he would be able to place me uh, in the political spectrum of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, conflict. So uh, this is a very good reason to have another textbook on this uh, uh, conflict. Uh, and the other reason, as I've already said, the fact that uh, the three authors uh, managed to come up with uh, a shared narrative actually provides a new insight that I don't think uh, we have in other uh, textbooks uh, uh, before. Although this book has a certain form of uh, synthesis of uh, research that has been uh, conducted previously by, uh, by others. Um, this is a point of, uh, I mean, we are celebrating this book, but I will still share some points of uh, critique that uh, I hope the two, the three authors will uh, address in the next uh, uh, panel. In my uh, class on the Israeli-Palestine conflict, I spent the last three sessions uh, discussing uh, possible solutions, resolutions, alternative ways to look forward constructively uh, into uh, the future. These are very pessimistic uh, three sessions, I have to say. Uh, because we come up with very bleak uh, projections of uh, the future, but we do engage with uh, everything that is out there from the two-state solution, I think that is the centerpiece of this uh, uh, book, to a binational composition, parallel state, whatever is out there that uh, has been proposed by different uh, think tanks, by different uh, uh, authors, we bring to class and we discuss it and uh, as I've said, we conclude this, uh, the class with a very bleak, uh, uh, I try to uplift myself and lie to the students about, yeah, it's gonna be great, it's, well, it's gonna be resolved. I tell them it's gonna be resolved because uh, you know history is history and like any conflict, it starts, it ends. History goes all about movement. This conflict will end. I don't know how, but it will. Uh, so uh, there's nothing like this in this uh, book, and I wonder if this was a strategic thinking, uh, something that the authors were thinking about and decided consciously to, uh, to ignore, not to deal with uh, here is what's proposed out there, and here is what we think about the different uh, proposals that uh, are floating uh, uh, there. The other point that I would like to raise uh, has already been addressed by uh, Shai and by uh, uh, Shibli and others, and that is the separation that the authors uh, make between what is undisputed and what is disputed. So the dispute is, uh, disputed is uh, discussed in the different uh, narratives, and this is an amazing uh, opportunity for uh, teachers of this conflict to take these narratives and uh, to bring them to class and actually ask the class to, to relate to these narratives and to juxtapose them. And uh, I think this is the, a very powerful teaching tool for us uh, students, the uh, teachers of this uh, uh, conflict. But then in reference to the undisputed, uh, according to them, undisputed sections of this, uh, parts of this uh, uh, conflict, they write, uh, and I quote, uh, it highlights these two sessions, highlight uh, facts that are not in dispute about the period uh, uh, addressed. And I question this, this ability to separate the two, and I think Shai actually addressed my critique in his own comments, where he added, uh, uh, I believe he said, uh, not in dispute among us three. Uh, and that's, that may be the, uh, the case, that the three authors managed 
to write this narrative that is not uh, in dispute for them three, but uh, I would argue that so many others would uh, point at these narratives, these two chapters, first chapters that are arguably not disputed and uh, make you know, very strong points about uh, the fact that, uh, or the point that uh, they actually may be uh, uh, disputed. Uh, the last point that I want to make is just a general observation about this uh, conflict. We teach the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and clearly Iran has become a major player in this uh, uh, conflict. For the past uh, 30 years, you cannot understand this conflict without understanding the, the, the way Iran has, the, the role Iran has played in this uh, uh, conflict to the point that sometimes uh, I don't share this thought with my students because I don't want to complicate the picture too much for them the point that I'm asking myself, uh, is there a way to reframe, to find a new title to this uh, conflict that goes beyond uh, Arab-Israeli uh, uh, because of the centrality of uh, uh, Iran? Maybe there is a need for uh, a fourth author that would join this book from 1978 onwards and then provide an Iranian narrative. I do not uh, uh, know, but uh, I think Iran challenges us uh, when we make any analysis of this conflict and we focus only on Israelis and uh, uh, Arabs because uh, uh, clearly Iran ha has played an major, a major role in this uh, conflict uh, in the last 30 to 40 years. Thank you. Asher, thank you very much. Uh, Dan. Uh, I too want to thank uh, Hala Aaron for uh, uh, invitation to come today. Um, by way of digression, um, in addition to the momentous occasion of the publication of this book, uh, being on this panel uh, forces me to say it's the first time in history that the football team of Princeton is ahead in the national polls of both Maryland and Notre Dame. So I just, just want that registered when we start here. Um, I, I would associate myself with uh, all of the praise that, uh, that you've heard so far. and. The fact that I'm not going to repeat it doesn't suggest that I, I don't feel it as strongly. This is a very strong contribution to um, uh, the world of teaching uh, the Middle East uh, uh, peace process, the Arab-Israeli peace process, and uh, I think it's going to be instrumental in the classroom. I've been teaching at Princeton now for eight years. I've taught the Arab-Israeli conflict. I have not used a textbook until this time. When I teach again, this is a textbook that I will feel very comfortable using. Um, on the issue of narratives uh, about which uh, uh, everyone has spoken so far, I, I would add a, a couple of points to um, what has already been said, uh, in addition to saying that in some respects this is the most useful contribution uh, of this volume, uh, because it's an attempt to take an area of growing interest uh, to scholars across many disciplines and now to apply it in a textbook on uh, one of the most contentious disputes uh, internationally. Uh, and in that respect, uh, I think uh, other uh, textbooks on other conflicts would be well advised to look at this model and see uh, how they can apply it uh, in, in their cases as well. Um, that said, uh, one of the, the questions that I had in, in reading particularly the narrative sections is that uh, in the narrative literature there are very important caveats that uh, are very often uh, necessary uh, for the students to understand. Uh, number one, not all narratives uh, are equal. Uh, we tend to want to think that, that uh, each party to a conflict is allowed to have a narrative. But if you look a couple of years ago, there was a conference at Harvard which looked at this question. And one of the best examples of this issue of not all narratives being equal was raised by one of the speakers who said, could we say in studying uh, World War II and the Holocaust that Hitler's narrative was equal to anyone else's narrative about what went on? And the answer is, of course, no. Now, I, I don't bring that as an example that applies here, but by way of introduction, um, I think it, it's going to be important for teachers, uh, before they let students just jump into the, nar the narratives, to uh, spend some time, to devote some time in the classroom to understanding the role of narratives in uh, both explaining a conflict and then in understanding a conflict. Uh, when I have taught the Arab-Israeli conflict, and I've started each one of those classes uh, with uh, a session on narratives, we spend almost half of the first classroom session thinking about 
um, the strengths and weaknesses of that approach. So we have here a gold mine of uh, actual narratives, uh, but it does put a burden on the, uh, the professors uh, to uh, put those narratives into uh, context. Um, uh, second on the question of narratives, uh, there, there, maybe I missed it, but there, I didn't see references to uh, some of the existing literature on narratives. Uh, at the University of Maryland, Paul Sham has put out now two volumes, uh, one called Shared Histories and one Shared Narratives, uh, th quite different from what these authors uh, have done here because they uh, uh, have not tried to use the question of narrative systematically uh, in each phase of the conflict. Uh, but again, I think it, uh, it will put a little bit of a burden on teachers to make sure that uh, there's a broader uh, texture to this uh, question. And finally, uh, I think as uh, Shibley made reference to and uh, Aaron hinted at it in his opening remarks, uh, it's understood and the, the authors explain why they did not include a U.S. narrative. And that's fair as an author's choice but it's a little bit strange, given the role that the United States has played and the fact that the U.S. narrative is, in many of these cases, so very different from the narratives of the parties. Uh, the book that Chibley referred to that uh, he and I and others worked on, in fact, um, emanated from our realization in doing some interviews for a different volume that we were hearing a very different stories not just from uh, Palestinians and Syrians, in that case, and Israelis, but also from Americans. And so as each of the parties to the negotiations and the third party, the United States, looked at particular events, they were looking at it, you know, kind of the blind man analyzing the elephant, each feeling or seeing a different part of the conflict. And in that respect, given the outsized role of the United States, uh, uh, professors, teachers are going to have to bring in that American narrative to complement uh, what's already in this uh, very good uh, textbook. Uh, I would also um, uh, echo a comment that, uh, that Shibley made towards the end of his presentation on uh, the breadth of coverage in this book, which is really quite, quite striking. Um, but again, the burden of going into depth on uh, individual issues. Uh, for example, Shibley drew on the Camp David chapter. Uh, I would draw on the uh, Madrid-Oslo uh, chapter, the Intifada Madrid-Oslo, where uh, the efforts of uh, the American negotiating team to bring about the Madrid Peace Conference, I think, are given about a paragraph. Now, I'm biased, of course. Uh, Aaron and I spent um, a lot of lunch times together during that period uh, trying to figure out what to do. So uh, I would be drawn, as obviously, to that, that section to see how the authors had covered it. Uh, so uh, my bias aside, uh, the reality is that uh, there are only three successful U.S. mediation efforts uh, in the entire peace process. And that's one of them, and it's given very short shrift. So it's something to think about um, as, as uh, we go ahead. There obviously will be subsequent chances for the authors to uh, think about uh, what, what needs to be done in the volume. In that respect, uh, there's one suggestion I have um, which doesn't require actually a, a second edition, and that is, uh, unless they've done it already, uh, an online resource guide. Uh, and that might solve uh, some of these immediate questions that we've been talking about. Uh, I would think it's important for, let me put it this way, if every classroom in the United States either had the three authors or my two colleagues sitting up here teaching this class, then this textbook is fine because they would be able to uh, supplement what's in the book with their wealth of knowledge. But unfortunately, not every college and university in the United States has this kind of strength, and, and therefore the authors might consider uh, providing some kind of a teaching guide uh, or resource guide uh, so that uh, the parts of the book that they have consciously decided uh, not to include or which they will subsequently think about uh, would actually then be pointed out to those, uh, those teaching. Uh, 
I do want to end, though, uh, in uh, reiterating what my colleagues up here have said. This is really quite an extraordinary uh, volume. And uh, uh, as I said uh, earlier, uh, it's one that I would feel not only comfortable using, but uh, very comfortable uh, recommending to uh, uh, others who are teaching this class. Dan, thank you. Well, let me make two observations, uh, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Um, ha having spent most of my professional adult life either working, studying, learning about this conflict, I'm absolutely persuaded that there is no gold standard for objectivity. No one that I've ever encountered, including myself, is objective when it comes to <clears throat> understanding, explaining, perhaps even uh, resolving the conflict. I mean, after all, we're all some totals of our own experiences. And it's very difficult to deny who and what you are and the impact of those experiences. The best you can do, in my view, is to make allowances, and it's very difficult for the prejudices, biases, and origins of your own views on this conflict. I mean, a prejudice is a prejudgment. That's what a, pre that's what a prejudice means. It's a prejudgment. And I find the triple narrative approach to this to be extremely useful in presenting that problem of objectivity and trying to unwind it. Um, I ran Seeds of Peace for three years, an organization that brings young people in conflict, not in the classroom, but in conflict, um, in an effort to try to find a way through professional facilitation and interaction, um, create uh, bonds of trust and break down the walls of suspicion and mistrust. And what you find among Indians and Pakistanis and Israelis and Palestinians in particular is that they come with narratives as authentic Israeli, Palestinian, Indian, and Pakistani nationalists. They don't abandon their own narratives. That would be misguided and wrong for any program to try to get them to deflate and give up the legitimacy of their own story. But what happens is they end up making space in their own narrative, not for the legitimization of the narrative of the other. I think that's too much of a stretch. But in terms of explaining the behavior of the so-called other, they accord that narrative um, a certain amount of understanding. And that, that is exactly what's happening here you're not going to reconcile the narratives. I'm not sure it's possible. It may not even be, be desirable. But the first stage, it seems to me, of solution is understanding and being willing to accept the reality that this is how the other sees his or her story. Second, I can't echo enough what Shibley and Dan have said about the American role. And it is not because uh, I'm necessarily a believer in the indispensability of that role, but of all the external actors to this conflict, the United States, for better or for worse, deserves pride of place. We are the, we are the responsible for protracting the conflict in some people's minds or resolving it. You cannot deny or ignore that role. And I would, I would second wholeheartedly in another edition, trying to include a chapter it doesn't retrace, as the others do, the three narratives, but creates, from the perspective of the Israelis, Palestinians, and the Arabs, the image and role of the United States in peacemaking. Dan was right. Three successful examples in 50 or 60 years of effective U.S. mediation. Kissinger's disengagement agreement, Carter's Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, and Baker's peace conference in Madrid. That's it. That's the sum total of su definitive successes on the part of the United States in this conflict. I think there should be a way to bound that and to offer up an another narrative. And as I looked at the sources, I must say I was surprised and disappointed that the one source I did not see cited was, and I don't want to embarrass them because we have two editors of the peace puzzle here, Th that book is quite an extraordinary 
overview and look. And I think in the second edition, that mistake should be corrected. But on, on balance, I think this is a fabulous enterprise. And let's, let's go to your questions. Please identify yourselves. Yes. Uh, do you want people to stand? No, not, no. Uh, Toby McCure, I'm with the uh, Wilson Cabinet. Uh, with regard to the including the U.S. for a narrative, that being the case, wouldn't it be equally uh, appropriate for Iran to be included in the narrative for the 30 years and the Russia from the post-war World War II, at least to the end of the Cold War, to help shape the... Uh, yeah, you know... Oh, one of the things, I mean, obviously the authors probably could answer that a little bit later on when in, in the, in, uh, the follow-up session. Uh, but I, I think the, the point about the U.S., I mean, Iran certainly is a player. And I think, uh, to be fair to the authors, they have an assessment of the regional context in which they talk broadly beyond, uh, beyond just the, the global context of, uh, of, of, of the international system, of obviously, of which the U.S., is central and featured centrally in, in that relatively brief analysis. It is, it, I think the, the U.S. role is profoundly different. Uh, it's not only profoundly different because I think you can't really tell the story of what transpired over the past half a century without reference to the central role in America in influencing events one or the other. But because the U.S was actually seen by the parties to be absolutely central. Because I think if you look at the Arab narrative, you know, dating back to uh, the time uh, Sadat made, uh, uh, you know, his, his, his initiative toward Israel, he used to say 90% of the cards are with the United States of America. His entire shift was geared toward the United States of America. Uh, the Israelis, uh, whatever they have, conflict with Iran or somebody else, um, there's most important priority in foreign policy, bar none, is protecting a strategic relationship with the U.S., above even the Iranian issue. Uh, and so in, in some ways, the, the, the role of the U.S. really can't be, de you know, just separated from the conflict itself. With Iran, I think you can look at Iran as being a certainly important player in the regional conflict. It is, increasingly so. I don't think that the role of Iran was particularly central in shaping that conflict over the years. Certainly, in, in more recently, with, with, particularly with regard to Hezbollah, but not so much in terms of impacting the decisions of Arab states in their relationship with Israel, or for that matter, even driving the Israeli decisions on what to do with the Arab states. So I think it should be included, but I just don't see their role to be so central historically to, to, to be featured in, in, in the book. I would add, if I might, oh, I'm sorry, um, what the authors have done with respect to whether it's Iran or Russia or others is to include the way in which their policies or actions have affected the international or regional environment at each stage of the conflict, and that's very useful. But, you know, to, to emphasize what Shibley is saying, how the United States viewed this conflict uh, and the conflict resolution process changes over time. And that's why I think all of us have flagged this issue. Uh, in a sense, if you have a section on the Iranian narrative, it's going to have one or two paragraphs kind of unchanging relative to the Arab-Israeli conflict from 1979 until today. Whereas tracing uh, U.S. views and U.S. policies and behaviors uh, is really a, a quite a different, uh, uh, a different exercise where you have uh, uh, debates over comprehensive versus interim approaches, where you have activists versus non-activist presidents, where you have engaged versus disengaged administrations. So there's a, there's a, a very different uh, set of issues related to the U.S. role, uh, which plays back into this narrative question. I want to say something just quick about the, the absence of the American narrative here. Nobody, question, nobody questions the fact that America has central role in this uh, conflict. But actually, I think what we may actually see here in the absence of an official American narrative or the centrality of uh, America in some of the descriptions here is 
how the United States is understood, perceived from the Middle East actors, uh, that despite its centrality, Middle Eastern leaders, societies, scholars, put not as much attention to U.S. role in this conflict as it may, uh, as it may, should, as it may have. And the focus that our panelists, American panelists, are putting on the United States' role in this conflict tells us their narrative of this conflict, that from their perspective, the U.S. is central and actually should be a whole new, a, th a fourth person writing this uh, book uh, that is American. But this, again, this is uh, talking about narrative. This is an American narrative that understands the conflict from that perspective, whereas we may actually see that these three authors coming from the Middle East have a different understanding of uh, the role of America. They see its centrality, but when they s analyze this conflict, they put it aside. Amal Lali. Thank you very much. I would like to agree with uh, <coughs> with Aaron about uh, the the uh, fact that this should have been included. Uh, I'm sorry for the self promotion, but I did my uh, PhD dissertation on the language that American diplomacy at the University of Maryland. At the University of Maryland, on the language that American diplomacy introduced into peacemaking and how this changed the Arab narrative. And it was fascinating to see how the language changed from 1969 from the Rogers Plan to the Camp David and to Oslo. And I think it's very important to talk about the Im impact of American diplomacy on peacemaking in the Middle East. But my question is, can somebody or uh, three of you or four of you talk about how different is the, Ameri the American administration's approach today from, from the other administrations in, in, and its role in the uh, peacemaking? Thank you. We could probably do an entirely new panel on that question. Uh, does anybody want to offer a brief comment? I'm going to restrain myself. Does anybody want to <laughs> offer a brief comment? A brief comment on that question, yeah. Yeah. Dan? I'll be very brief. Um, <clears throat> as I indicated in my previous response, uh, administrations have varied in the degree of intensity and exposure that they're prepared for in uh, this conflict. Uh, the Obama administration, since uh, coming into office, uh, has. Uh, made a conscious decision to elevate the centrality of the conflict resolution process uh, in the national uh, security priorities of the of the president. The president did it himself on day one in appointing George Mitchell and saying that this is uh, an important national security priority. It's a whole different question of whether or not they've done a good job, and that's where I think Aaron's right. We would need a separate panel to, and probably a longer panel than just a 45 minutes. Um, but the reality is that this administration, unlike any of its immediate predecessors, certainly the Bush administration, uh, as Shibley and I argue in uh, our volume, including the Clinton administration, we tend to think of the Clinton administration as kind of manic in pursuit of peace. But that only came in the last year and a half or two years. There were six years when uh, the Clinton administration made very clear that the Middle East conflict was not a high priority and not a national security priority. So this administration is, um, uh, I think, since, since the administration of Jimmy Carter is the first to uh, elevate the importance of, uh, of the conflict in our own foreign policy narrative, if we keep using that phrase. Yes, uh, in the back there. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Michael Brenner, Center for Israel Studies, American University. Um, I may have missed I didn't see the book yet, and, and, and maybe it's in there, but I wonder if we really can still tell the conflict in terms of the Israeli and the Palestinian or the Arab narratives, and if it's not much more complicated, if we don't have an Israeli left narrative, an Israeli right narrative, and a Palestinian narrative, which Palestinian narratives which are different, and if certain Palestinian narratives aren't actually very close to an Israeli left, narrative, so I wonder if we still can think in these terms or if it's not much more complicated for a textbook as well. I mean, I very much appreciate it. I think I'll use it as well in my classes, but that's what I think is more and more the case, more than it used to be. Yeah, I, I think it's really an interesting point, but I, I think it's not a problem for the book, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because I think you could you could divide everything into smaller and so smaller units. Uh, undoubtedly, you know, 
it's just a question of where you draw a line, like in everything else. So, yes, of course, there are multiple Israeli narratives and multiple Palestinian narratives, multiple American narratives. But when you're starting with a conflict when there's no discussion of narrative at all, there are some broad outlines that are really sort of a collective uh, broad narrative with, with some variation. And so when you are using that to to introduce a student to a subject, you got to draw the boundaries somewhere. And I think in that sense, you know, of course you can always pursue additional conversations in classroom, but I don't think you can get into that in, in depth, frankly. And, and I don't see that as troubling because at, at some point you have to draw the lines. Yeah. The authors allude actually to this uh, problem at the beginning, mm -hmm. and they recognize that problematic and they say, you know, we have to find some middle ground here to tell more or less the middle of the road narrative of these two or three uh, parties. And that's, you know, it's an educational tool. You have to do that in a class, uh, uh, you can call it, you know, strategic essentialism. You, <laughs> you strategically use this uh, tweak in order to educate your students, knowing yourself that it's more complicating than that. I think we have time for two more questions. Yes. Here. Thank you. Chen Ken from the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. Um, obviously, this book sounds uh, the perfect tool for teachers in the U.S. The question is about the region. And since textbooks in English are not often used in the region, uh, the question is, is it going to be translated or aim to be translated uh, to the region, to the languages of the region, and then how uh, how it will be accepted in the region as a teaching tool. We should leave the first part of that question for the next session. It's a fascinating one. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have a brief comment on well, how it's Well, it's, it's a great question. And, and, you know, there was a, um, an effort a couple of years ago to create a, a textbook which had the Israeli and Palestinian narratives down two columns on a page and a blank column in the middle of the page in which students were then going to be asked to try to figure out how to deal with it. But interestingly, that effort was also in English. Um, so uh, in a sense, the language of negotiations, which has always been English, has now uh, intruded upon the language of instruction. But I, as Aaron said, we'll leave the other question to the authors. Yeah. The centrality of language here is important. You know, there is a joke in Hebrew of what does, what does BA and MA mean? BA means Bli uh, Anglit, without English, and MA means Me'at Anglit, little English. <laughs> So, <laughs> one final question. Um, here, I guess that's the final question. Thank you. We seem to be talking a bit about a lot about narratives and and uh, the U.S. Uh, foreign policy. So I wanted to kind of push the question forward. What is how does the Obama doctrine fit into the uh, current narrative? Well, what's the what's the Obama doctrine for what? The Obama doctrine, that the emerging Obama, Obama doctrine, but I would like each of you to perhaps in your own way define it. Uh, on the Arab-Israeli issue, you mean? In the Middle East in general, yeah. Um, well, I, I think, you know, uh, I think D D Dan and I are in agreement on, on the fact that, um, uh, that this president, when he, from really from day one when he came to office, um, perhaps came with the view, and I think it's been reinforced o over time, um, that uh, that Arab-Israeli uh, peace is a national security interest of the United States of America. So in, in a way, it was defined that way for the first time in a long time, because Clinton, while he thought there were benefits to the U, uh, that, that could accrue to, uh, to the U.S. from Arab-Israeli peace, in principle, he did it because he thought it was good for the Israelis and, and the Arabs. It was an opportunity that emerged with the Oslo agree, uh, Accords and uh, ultimately became part of his legacy, but never really saw it as a national security priority. Uh, and I think you can argue while the Bush administration grew to see it as more important over time, certainly didn't start with it as a national security priority, and I think the president probably never internalized it in that way. And so I think that the, the president's, uh, you know, and, and, and I would argue the secretary of state, uh, see it in those terms, in, 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 in the sense of defining it that way. What that means for them, or how they implement it, or do they really understand how much of a priority it is in, in relation to other issues, I think that's where the debate is, and I think there's unclarity. Um, obviously, when you look at all the things that the administration 
is facing now globally and at home. Uh, and uh, for the President to go to the United Nations and say, for the rest of this administration, I'm going to focus on the Iran issue and the Arab Israel issue, that's a pretty big thing for a President to say. That's exactly what I was, that's, that's exactly what I was alluding to, was his, his narrowing, his strict narrowing of, of the focus of the administration for the rest of its time in office, essentially. He really did put down a, a throw down the gauntlet and say we're not, we're only going to fo focus on these issues. I mean, is that a is that <laughs> the language is clearly changing? The active verbs are becoming much more passive. Yeah, I, I'd only add that this administration has a history of its rhetoric exceeding its capacity, <laughs> and in, in the gap, American credibility ends up taking a big hit. There's a real tension between risk readiness on this issue and what I call risk aversion. And I think Shibley is 100 percent right. The ultimate balance is, uh, remains, remains to be seen. One additional point. Learning a lot about the art of shameless self-promotion, I have a suggestion for the three authors. You know, the three of you are a story unto yourselves. I mean, you, you may or may not grasp it, but I'm sitting here looking at the three of you, and I'm thinking I'm a marketing agent for this book, I would have the three of you literally in conversation using the book as an instrument, you know, on every major talk show because there's a story here that needs to be told and the story is the three of you. Forget the book for a moment. That conversation, Robin knows this, that conversation is worth having on a national on a national scale. So again, unsolicited advice. Do your own self-promotion, but it's really, really has a lot of potential. Coffee break, and then we're going to adjourn. Robin, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Thank you very much, and thank our three commentators. Thank you.